Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another episode of Whose Gene Is It Anyway? I am your host, as always, Justin. I am excited for today's show. I think it's going to be a good one. Um, I mean, aren't they always? Um, but anyway, um, today is going to be a really fun topic. We're going to be talking about de-extinction, cloning, uh, lab-grown meat, bioremediation, fixing ecosystems, all kinds of stuff. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're going to get into it in just a moment. As you can see, there is a donation bar down below here. Uh, that is to continue to raise money for our ongoing project of growing human neurons connected to a computer. And today I have a very special treat to start us off. This is the very first uh, pr new prototype uh, neuron electrode array. Um, so I don't think the camera will focus very well. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. But if you want to see a better picture of this, there are some brand new pictures up on Instagram. Uh, so links links down below if you want to see those. I'm pretty excited. So yeah, uh, if you want uh, me to answer a question while we're going through the, uh, the presentation today, um, feel free to donate uh, by using the link below, uh, the Streamlabs link. And uh, yeah, then I'll answer your question while we're, while we're talking through some stuff. So anyway, Neuron Array, very excited. Neuron's coming soon. All right, let's get into it. All right, today we're talking about de-extinction. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, de-extinction, what is it? Why should we do it? How does it work? Animal cloning, does it work the way it does in movies? Exploring the basics of the process. And then lab-grown meat, uh, is it a good, good idea? How it works? All that kind of stuff. So where did this idea come from? Well, if you have been following the news lately, you may have seen a an article uh, about... Uh, mammoth meatballs, <laughs> which, uh, you know, it's, it's a very catchy headline. You know, they have these, these very dramatic pictures. But what is the reality versus what they actually did? Um, you know, so there's, like I said, there's all these, like, really super dramatic uh, things. And they're like, well, it probably doesn't taste like woolly mammoth. Yeah, the reason it doesn't taste like woolly mammoth is because that's not actually what they grew. Um, so what they did was they took sheep cells and they took a protein or the, 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 the code for a protein from woolly mammoth, and they put that protein and express that protein in sheep cells. Now, this isn't particularly, well, interesting, for one. Um, it's, it's very click-worthy, but at the end of the day, they, they've basically just made sheep cells with one extra protein, which is exceedingly easy to do if you've seen any of the other um, uh, episodes uh, that we've done. You'll know that you know, modifying things to express one new protein is super, super easy. Um, and we're, you're actually going to see us do that in an upcoming video very shortly, uh, where we're going to be taking mouse cells and getting them to express proteins from a variety of different places, tardigrades um, and coral, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept and it's very click worthy, but it's not really de-extinction. It's not really, you know, lab grown mammoth. But so what is de-extinction? Like, what is it really? Basically, the idea is you take something that is extinct. As long as you have a uh, specimen of the extinct animal, it is theoretically possible to bring it back to life. Um, it's, it's not easy, mind you, um, but it is possible. Um, and, uh, like... The examples that tend to be given are things like the woolly mammoth or the dodo or the Tasmanian tiger. Like these are the, the really click worthy ones, but they're also the least interesting to me and, and, on, and honestly to most ecologists. The, the problem with things like uh, the woolly mammoth or the dodo is they've been extinct for a really long time. Like even if it was only 100 years, um, something that's been extinct like many, many decades, the ecosystem moves on pretty quickly. Um, and also changes. Like the reason these things went extinct is for a variety of reasons, but a lot of it is is habitat change or habitat loss. So you can't just grow new ones and put them back where they used to be and hope that it's going to just work out. Um, you know, one of the one of the other ones here is um, the the blue finned walleye, uh, which is a species that was previously extremely common in the Great Lakes in, in Canada and the U.S. Uh, but it was basically just went, driven to extinction through uh, invasive species and damage to the ecosystem. So, you know, yes, you could theoretically make one, but where are you going to put it? 
right? Like you can't just put it back in the, into the ecosystem it came from because that ecosystem is destroyed, basically. So you would have to first reset the ecosystem, then put the fish back. Uh, but that's, that's rarely how it's viewed. Um, so what do you actually need to de-extinct something? Well, I mean, the, really, it's two things. Um, the first is high-quality specimens. You need to be able to get as clean of a DNA read as physically possible um, in order to uh, be able to get, um, uh, like, all the code that you need. Uh, so that way you can then recreate that code and put it back into a living system. Um, and then the second thing that you need is a compatible host or some other method of growing the new organism. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so just a, we got a quick donation from uh, Space Tot 101. Um, so thank you, Space Tot. Uh, it says, how does genetic modification work? Would something super custom be possible, like a fluffy snake, a watermelon that's blue, etc.? Uh, I would recommend you watch our previous streams because then you'll see how easy genetic engineering is uh, or how, or, and some of the things that are possible. A fluffy snake would be very hard, though. Anyway, back to de-extinction. So there are a couple of companies that are working on this. Vow is the one that did the mammoth beatball. Um, but the company that's actually trying to actively de-extinct things is called Colossal or Colossal Bioscience. And so I need to be careful in how I describe them um, because I think it's a lot of wanky nonsense that are is being used to like extract large quantities of money out of investors. Um, but that's not to say that the science isn't good or the scientists they have aren't good. But as a rule, if something is advertised as a George Church company and you're very excited about a genetics thing because George Church was involved, that doesn't actually mean anything. Like, they, they slap his name onto all kinds of stuff these days to basically raise a billion dollars to do nothing um, over and over and over and over again. <laughs> um, so I would take it with a grain of salt. I mean, it's, it's, it's potentially very cool, but it's also just the most vanity project that you've ever seen for exactly the reasons that I just talked about, which is these organisms are useless. Like they do not serve a purpose in the ecosystem presently. So it is totally just a rich people vanity project. Um, but that's not to say that the technology isn't um, useful, right? If you pick more reasonable targets, it's a very useful technology. Whereas if you're just focusing on mammoth, you're basically making toys for rich people or food for rich people. But we'll, we'll get to that. So yeah, why, why de-extinction? And it's really, it's the things that I've already been saying, which is uh, zoo curiosities. Uh, so, you know, yeah, you could have a Jurassic Park type dealio. Maybe not Jurassic Park because uh, dino DNA is usually so degraded that you can maybe pull out a gene or two if there's like protein remnants. So you can like sequence the protein remnants and reverse engineer what the DNA might've been. Uh, but there's not like a complete genome. So it's, it's more like you could have woolly mammoths, Tasmanian tigers, dodos, this sort of thing. Um, but it, it would only ever really be zoo, zoo curiosities. I mean, um, you know, ecological restoration groups would fight you tooth and nail if you attempted to put one of these things just back out into the world. Um, but also they just don't, they don't serve the purpose that the the company claims that they do. Like you can't fix an ecosystem by putting mammoths on it. Um, that said, mammoths are very cool. It'd be nice to have some mammoths around, but it would it would basically be stuck as a zoo curiosity. Um, the the other option is it's exotic food. It's it's you know with the the rise of uh, lab grown meat and uh, these sorts of de extinction technologies, yeah, you know rich people could pay to eat mammoth, um, and you know it's like a gloating thing or whatever. Um, which isn't which isn't really that like like that's not a, a reason to get that excited about it, but it's not. I mean, it's not not interesting, but it's also not something that you'd find in like Whole Foods. Um, you know, next to the kangaroo and the ostrich, there's just some mammoth, or maybe maybe there would be, but like beyond that, it's it's kind of the limit for these super ancient organisms. Whereas if you're talking about um, things that were very recently extinct, like say in the last five ten years the habitats probably still exist um, and the ecosystems probably could still benefit from reintroduction of those uh, organisms, even if it was in like say the past hundred years. So for example, there there's, and, and we'll talk more about this at sort of near the end where we talk more about ecosystem restoration, but there's examples of, you know, reintroducing wolves to areas um, and having the ecosystem rebalance because they were missing their top predator. Uh, but you, you know, that, so that, makes sense if the thing is recently extinct. Um, 
The other way that this could make sense is just having like ecosystem backups. So if you know you th think that an ecosystem is under threat, you could go through, sequence everything, and ideally take tissue samples of everything you can get your hands on and bank it so that if that ecosystem was ever destroyed, theoretically you could rebuild it from scratch um, and, and you know put all the correct stuff back in the right places and have it sort of reset. Um, but that's, I mean, the, the engineering would be on a scale that is unseen to this point in, in the technology. Um, and then the other is if you have the ability to arbitrarily make animals basically from goo, um, you know, that actually might make more sense for shipping animals out into space. Um, so be it for, for livestock or um, whatever other reasons, like if you're terraforming Mars or something. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that near the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's talk about how you would actually, like, do this, right? Like, you know, but if you want to de-extinct something, you have to, the first thing that you have to be able to do is clone, because you don't, you do not have the animal to start with. So you, you have to start with some other animal and do a little switchy switch uh, with the DNA and have its DNA put into a host's uh, cell, take over, and then be able to be grown into a full animal. So this is the basic uh, way that the clo like cloning works. Um, you start with a uh, sample from the animal that you want to clone. Um, in this case, you'd have to make that cell basically from scratch, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but let's let's say that you have saved tissue samples from something that's about to go extinct, rather than something that's fully extinct. Um, you save the tissue samples, and you have um, you know fibroblasts or just any kind of tissue works really. Um, then you take uh, the oocyte, so an egg, uh, from a donor or uh, like a like a donor organism. So if you're doing something that's uh, extinct, then you want the closest relative, ideally. Um, so you know if you're doing mammoths, you would want elephant eggs. Um, so you, you get the elephant eggs, you remove the nucleus uh, from the elephant egg, and then replace it with the nucleus from the tissue sample that you've grown. Um, and then fuse them together and basically kickstart the process and it will actually, and then you have a, a now growing embryo, which you can then implant back into a, a host animal. Um, you know, so in this case it'd be elephants and then you grow a mammoth, you know, theoretically it's basically as easy as that. Obviously this whole process is quite complicated and difficult to get right. Um, but it, this is the basics of the process and how it would work. So what, what does this actually look like? Because, um, you know, people talk about cloning all the time, but there's, it's very rare that they show pictures. Um, so this is the basic apparatus that you need for cloning something. Um, it's, a, it's an invert microscope with two micro-manipulators and micro-injectors. Um, you know, these, these are things that you could theoretically DIY. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it is a thing that you could do. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's basically it. It's, it's, you know, two pokey things and a microscope. So when you actually look at it stepwise, uh, this is, this is the, the process of cloning. So you start with your, your donor oocyte, um, which still has all of its DNA and such in it. Um, and you first rotate it um, until this little blob, um, hopefully you can see my mouse there, uh, but there's this tiny little blob just a little bit below and to the left of the, the micro needle. Um, and this is called the M2 spindle. So this is basically where all of the uh, DNA is hanging out right now, um, or, or rather, it's 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 actually right here. Sorry, this is the polar body. This is this is the thing right here. Um, so then, these little cells in in B, C, and D are just fibroblasts or or whatever other donor cells that you want. So this is where the nucleus that you so this is where like your woolly mammoth cells would be, right? Um, so basically, what you do is you suck up one of the little cells into the needle and then spurt it back out and then suck it up and then spurt it back out a couple of times which basically shreds the, the cell, but leaves the nucleus basically intact. Uh, so then you suck up the little nucleus, and then you go back over to your, your egg, and you push the needle all the way into the back, and then inject, and in sort of like a, a smooth motion, uh, you inject the new nucleus while retracting the needle until you get to, do you see this little blob here? Um, that's actually the, the M2 spindle. I was mistaken before. Um, so you, you bring the needle back out until you get to the M2 spindle, and before you pull the needle out, you suck the M2 spindle up and then suck it out. And basically then the, the last step is you've got to close up the little hole. And the way that you do this is with just a pulse of electricity. Um, and 
then it just reseals, and you now have a complete egg. So basically then what you do is you repeat this several dozen times so you have as many eggs to work with as physically possible but then you basically have a, an embryo ready to go so all it has to be all that has to be done uh, is to uh, implant this into a host and theoretically it would grow into a mammoth now the reason that cloning is hard is not actually because the process itself is difficult like this bit is actually fairly straightforward the reason cloning is hard is because it rarely works properly so for the number of eggs that you implant, the number of actually like healthy, viable offspring that you get is very low. So you end up with like a lot of like malformed stuff and, you know, things ju that just don't work properly. Um, so you end up having to just do this over and over and over and over and over again until you get that first viable uh, organism. So like Dolly the sheep is one of the really... Um, uh, you know, is one of the, the really famous examples of this. It took a lot of sheep before they got Dolly the sheep. <laughs> um, and this is sort of the reason why we don't do human cloning. I mean, A, it's just freaking expensive. Uh, but also, you end up with a lot of dead babies. It's, it's, it's pretty brutal. Um, so it's, it's not a process that people are really comfortable with. Um, and then there's the legal and ethical and all the other stuff. So it, it's a bit iffy. Um, so this is just another little view of sort of what this looks like. Uh, just uh, It's basically what I said. You know, suck out, the, suck out the spindle, put it in a new nucleus, give it a zap, and, and let it go. Um, another example is you don't necessarily need to use an oocyte from the same organism. So in this case, this is showing uh, taking the spindle out of a mouse oocyte and putting it into a pig oocyte and vice versa. And that can make some very weird, you know, chimeric stuff. I don't think anybody's attempted to grow. Like, I don't think this is viable. I don't think it grows into a full thing. But this is much closer to what it would be like for de-extinction because you're not, you're obviously, you don't have, you know, mammoth eggs. Um, but what happens if you don't have oocytes? Uh, well, you can actually grow them. Um, you know, this is one of those things where something that people are often told is uh, that, you know, you when you're, you know, when women are born, they have the number of eggs that they're going to have when, yeah, recent evidence, this is not true. Um, you keep growing more. Um, and if you stimulate the right cells, then you can induce the formation of oocytes uh, from stem cells. It's, it's tricky, but it is possible. And so you could just, so if you had uh, your mammoth cells, you could induce them to turn into stem cells and then induce them to turn into oocytes and then go through the whole process. So you could, you could build it all the way up from scratch. So yeah, now you've got your, your embryo. The next thing is you basically just have to implant it into a healthy host. So in this case, it's showing mice. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend uh, trying to grow a mammoth in a mouse. It's not going to work very well. Um, but, you know, it, that's the idea. Um, and you mostly just kind of stick it in there and let it go. And then whichever ones attach properly are the ones that end up growing. Um, this, so this is another option. If you don't have um, a, a womb, a, a womb uh, available, uh, potentially we might be able to do it artificially soon. So this um, rotary culture was able to grow mice up to 11 days um, before they, they stopped it. Um, and really, the, thing, the, the only thing that stops them from growing it up to a full mouse is they need to be able to connect a blood supply at the point where they grew it. So they're getting very, very, very close to artificial wombs, which I think is just fascinating. Um, and not only were they able to grow it from, like, they were able to take an embryo out of a, a mouse uh, and then grow it in this system. They were also able to start from stem cells, like pure stem cells. They didn't make eggs and sperm. They just went straight from stem cells directly into embryo. Uh, which was really quite impressive and pretty wild. And um, then they were able to grow things that look exactly like normal embryos, which is pretty, pretty crazy. So the, the technology for um, artificial uh, wombs and, and cloning is actually getting much, much better, which is, the, is sort of what's making efforts to uh, de-extinct things sort of viable. Uh, this is another option. This, this was from a few years ago where they uh, st uh, started a little bit later in the process. So they waited until the embryo had developed uh, like the, um, what's it called? Come on, brain fart. Um, the, the, like the feeding tube. Eh, doesn't matter. Anyway, the um, umbilical cord. There we go. I'm sorry, a bit slow today. 
Uh, but they so they waited until the umbilical cord had formed in the embryo before they removed it from the original uh, parent organism. And then they were able to transfer it into this bag system and were able to grow it to completion from there. So we are so we have two different technologies. One that is able to grow the uh, initial embryos up to the point of needing an umbilical cord. And we have technology that goes post umbilical cord to complete organism. So now you just kind of have to put the two together, grow the, you know, you grow the little carousel of, of embryo up to the point where it has an, uh, needs an umbilical cord. You connect an umbilical cord to it. Then you move, excuse me, move it to the bag system. And you now have, essentially you've, you've grown an, an animal completely without a, a parent, which is pretty wild. Um, and if you do this entirely from stem cells, you've essentially just made a whole organism from a single cell, which is pretty wild. Um, okay, so just a, a really quick, a, a really quick aside about uh, TV and film, just because I found this really interesting. <laughs> um, so this is for a, a scene or, or some some screenshots from a scene from the TV show Invincible, um, which I personally love. This is not sponsored. This is just very cool. And uh, one of the characters ends up cloning themselves. And what they show is remarkably like what the real process was. And this was actually this, this was actually what prompted me to look up how cloning works the first time. Because, you know, it's, it's the thing that we'd, we'd heard about it many times. I'd heard about it while I was in university briefly. Um, but as, as sort of a curiosity, as like, this is a thing that they did. But, I, you know, I never really knew the process. Uh, but this show, I, after seeing this scene, it was kind of like, does it? Does it work like that? And yeah, it, it, it works pretty much exactly like this, <laughs> which I found very impressive. Um, so that's that's just a fun aside, really. Okay, now, so for cloning for de-extinction, there's kind of a couple other problems. One is you don't have the initial tissue necessarily. Like if you're going for a mammoth, you definitely don't. Whereas if you're go, going for something that isn't quite extinct yet or is very recently extinct, you maybe have a sample already. Uh, but if you don't, you have to build the entire chromosomes from scratch. Um, oh, um, we got a we got a donation. Oh, space top, thank you again. Uh, if someone's interested in genetic modification, wants to do stuff like that, work with genetic modification, etc. Where would they start? Uh, how would they get in gen genetic modification work area? Um, I would go to university for biochem, molecular biology, synthetic biology, that sort of thing. Um, it's your best way to get into it. Um, and as for finding jobs, I mean, that's <laughs> that the, the, the joke with, uh, uh, you know, most biograds is, you know, what, what are the main jobs for a biograd making coffee? Um, uh, unfortunately there's, there's a lot more biograds than there are, uh, bio jobs, but I think, but that is rapidly changing. Um, you know, biology today is where computers were about 30 years ago. So it's, it's going to be the next big frontier. So, you know, it's better to get in now. Uh, but anyway, back to, back to printing uh, chromosomes. So if you're going to print a chromosome, the it, it's it's a huge undertaking, even just to print one. And so this is an example from a paper where they printed an entire yeast chromosome from scratch, because yeast, yeast only have the one, uh, usually. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on the species, but a lot of them only have one big chromosome. So if you print the whole thing, uh, you could just do a little switchy switch and replace the one that's in the yeast, and then you could have a totally de novo synthesized chromosome. Uh, but for something like a mammoth, there's a lot more chromosomes and there's a lot more to do. So you kind of have to do this over and over and over again. And so basically the way that this works is you print little fragments, which you then stick together into bigger fragments, which you stick together into yet bigger fragments until you've built up the whole chromosome, which is a huge, huge undertaking and extremely expensive. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of code to print. And I mean, even if it's like nine cents a base pair, if you've got to print three billion base pairs... It's a lot of money, uh, so it's 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 quite the undertaking. But once you once you have your printed chromosomes, um, then you can start inserting them. So the way that you do this is you essentially there's a, a, a technique called microcell suspension. So you essentially break a cell into individual chromosomes, or you're making these micro pockets of mostly a cell with uh, one like exactly one chromosome in each little fragment. And so this way you could, you know, have your, your one chromosome uh, from a, your, your first mammoth chromosome, and then you fuse it to a, your recipient cell. Uh, and then through division, you're going to end up with 
uh, you know, some of the daughter cells have the correct chromosome and some of them don't. So then you isolate the ones that do, and then you start the whole process over again. You, you know, isolate a, another single chromosome, you know, fuse it in, and then isolate the clones that have exactly the correct number of chromosomes and type. Um, it would be an enormous undertaking to replace every single chromosome in something, but it is doable. Like, I think that the thing I want to reiterate the most throughout this whole stream is that while all of these technologies would be very, very expensive and extremely difficult, none of this is impossible. It's hard, but it's not impossible. Um, it would just be a lot of work, and it would probably take you, you know, 10 or 15 years to, to really do it properly. But it is, it is doable. It is doable. Um, so, now, what do you do with your, your, like, once you build your first cell... Right, like once you once you have your first collection of cells of that new de-extincted organism, what do you do with it? Um, and the answer is, you kind of have two or three options. You know, the first is find a host. Like if you're going for, I'm going to make a full animal. Um, you either find a host or do the artificial womb thing or whatever, um, and you you grow a full animal. Or option two, you go la lab grown meat. Now, lab grown meat is something that's becoming more and more common. Um, it's, I don't think it's you, it's really available in stores yet, but it is getting to the point where it's going to be very soon. And there, like, there's a lot of technical challenges with it that they've mostly solved, but there's still a lot that they haven't. So it's probably not as great as people bill it, but it's also not as bad as people bill it. Um, so... You know, it's 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 definitely interesting. But one of the markets for this, like, yeah, it's it's great to grow cow. But one of the ways to help drive uh, interest and attraction is exactly what Vox did, which is you start producing proteins. Uh, you know, like the mammoth protein sheep thing. Um, if you could grow full mammoth cells and make mammoth steaks, the weirdness of it could be a selling factor, and you could charge way more. So you could build the funds to have more cheap options like, you know, cow uh, available. But it, it's still, it's always going to be kind of a niche product. Um, but for, for growing lab-grown meat, it's not a particularly difficult process. Um, if you, if you uh, not our latest video, but the video we did the month before that, uh, so in February, I think, um, we actually showed how to grow uh, animal cells uh, in, in our video. And Basically, the difference between this and lab-grown meat is just scale. Uh, so we grew very small amounts because I, I was just doing, you know, sort of regular tissue culture stuff. Uh, but the um, the process is essentially the same. You just do more of it. Um, so you grow way more cells, way more liquid. You'd probably do it in suspension culture if you can. Um, and then once, you're, once you have that, you seed a scaffold with uh, the cells that you want. And so this is sort of what this looks like. You know, you have all of the different cell types. So you can start with um, a biopsy, isolate stem cells, uh, differentiate them into all the different cell types that you want, uh, or, or the progenitors of the cell types that you want, um, and then um, uh, grow them, seed them onto a scaffold, and then let it grow. And then you've got like something that's basically the same as meat. Uh, uh, Ayrton just donated. Thank you, Ayrton. Um, is the technique used by Cartman from South Park to clone a pizzeria more advanced? I do not know. I have I I don't watch a lot of South Park, so I'm not really sure. Sorry. Um, um but yeah, so that's that's basically what lab grown meat is. So it's it's not that difficult. Um at some point on the channel we'll we'll probably do something like this. Or not probably, we we plan on doing stuff something like this. Um right now we're looking at turning bread into meat, um, and also rice krispies into bones. Because it sounds fun, mostly, and I want to know if they snap, crackle, and pop. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's it's a pretty straightforward process. So, really, the only difference between what they're already doing and growing a mammoth is just that first step where you have to do all of this stuff, where you print the chromosome and do the thing. Um, I saw some questions in the, in the, uh, in the, the feed that are, are basically asking how chromosomes are printed. And the way that they, that works is, like I said before, you, you print little short pieces of DNA. So, um, there's DNA printers. You can just buy them or you can just pay to have it done. Um, and they can print up to about 180 letters long. So you basically have to print out tens of thousands of little pieces that are 180 letters long and then stick them all together carefully um, in the correct order so that it all 
you know, becomes one big chromosome. So what you would do is you'd, pr you'd print out, you know, a hundred sections or whatever, um, stick those together into bigger sections and then put the bigger sections together until you've got a whole chromosome, which is what they did here. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's possible. Um, but yeah. Oh, there we go. So yeah, coming to a supermarket near you could be mammoth stakes uh, because that just might be the only way to get the, the technology out there. But it is possible. Um, there is the, the potential that this might be the future we get. Um, this is from uh, Transmetropolitan, one of my all-time favorite graphic novels. Um, and in their stores, they you can buy anything you want. Human meat, caribou eyeballs, you know, squid tentacles that are, you know, grown extra big, whatever you want. Um, they have just... Their, their technology is essentially peaked, so they can do stuff like this with very little effort. Uh, so, yeah, one day you might be able to go buy a bucket, bucket of caribou eyeballs at your local uh, Whole Foods. But, you know, that's, that's pretty dystopian. Like, it's, it's pretty drab and dark to think about, um, like, the only uses for de-extinction being, uh, you know, just food. <laughs> Um, you know, it's very grim, dark future, uh, which is not my favorite. Um, so I've been playing a lot of this game lately. It's called Terra Nil. Um, this is not, again not a not a not a sponsor. I just really like the game, um, and it's bas it's basically just a city builder where instead of building c cities, you build ecosystems and then you know remove all of your presence from the land. I really like it, um, but it's it's basically been making me think a lot about uh, ecosystems and and rebuilding ecosystems. So you know, in areas where there's been a lot of clear cutting or um, you know the coast has been destroyed or or whatever the case may be, you know, rebuilding ecosystems I personally think is kind of the best uh, use for this technology, and it's also like the most viable like. If there was ever a point of de-extincting something, it would be to de-extinct something that was just, just extinct. Like we just, you know, we couldn't get our shit together well enough to prevent the event happening, but at least we can like mop up the mess afterwards. Um, and, you know, something that you could do, um, and I think we should probably start doing, is going through ecosystems and building up genetic catalogs of everything, every single thing you can find. Um, every plant, every animal, every fungus, all of it, and just building catalogs of it. So that way, when an ecosystem inevitably gets destroyed by human activity, uh, whenever the you know humans are done ruining the area, um, when we want to put it back and you know make it nice again, then we would have a catalog where we could go, okay, just you know print out X Y Z and you know bibbity bobbity, recreate all the different organisms and just put them back. Um, it, it would be very, very difficult to do. Um, it would be a huge undertaking. But at this point, I mean, the, the, the world is kind of only being left with difficult options. So it's uh, kind of inevitable. So we might as well prepare for it. And this technology, this is essentially the only actual use of this technology that I don't think is incredibly dumb. Like, you know, mammoth steaks sound really fun, but I'm much more interested in just repopulating walleye and... Uh, and the bees and, and all of the other, right? Like it could, this could be a job, right? Like there could be, instead of, you know, the, the vanity companies like George Church's wanky nonsense, um, if you were actually just focused on rebuilding ecosystems and de-extincting the animals that had just gone bad or, or gone missing, um, there's just, I just think that there's so much more value in that personally rather than like somebody's weird ego trip. Um and yeah, that's, I mean, that's really just sort of the, the one way to look at it. Um, and, it, you know, if we already have a, a seed vault. Like, so this is the Svalbard uh, seed vault where, um, you know, tens and tens of thousands of different types of seeds are being, and, uh, are being saved specifically to prevent ex exactly something like this from happening, which is when an ecosystem goes or, or is damaged, um, there is a repository of genetic material which can be used uh, to regrow it so in this case you just plant the seeds they're plants you don't you don't need to do any weird uh, cloning to them but i mean seeds only last for so long so you also have to be uh you know regularly re-upping the the seed vault and and replacing the specimens that are getting really old um growing ones that have been sitting around for too long and, and producing new seeds um but if we have a seed vault like why don't we have a meat vault 
Like it just it, to me, it just makes sense to have a facility somewhere where you can just s- maintain massive quantities of samples of all of the different fauna and flora from around the world because we're gonna we're, like we're th- thankfully humans are moving towards the direction of um, wanting to not completely obliterate the planet um, and really the you know even though we're, we're headed in the direction of wanting to fix it we're still actively doing damage and you know there thanks to like several corporations and you know corrupt politicians and such like or like ecosystems are still going to get destroyed um, and damage is still going to be done and you know developing countries are still going to develop and so that's going to damage more ecosystems and it's Basically, it's sort of inevitable, so it makes the most sense to me to prepare for the inevitability rather than just hoping that we're going to be okay or that we're not going to do it when we, we know that we, we will. Um, so this way, you know, threatened species are not that, they, not that they could be ignored. They still need to be dealt with, but at least you have an emergency, you know, break glass in case of extinction option as opposed to just, you know, you know, good night, sweet prince, and and off into the oblivion you go. Um, so it's, it, I think it, it's a very reasonable um, option, personally. Um, oh, Luca donated. Thank you, Luca. Um, and I'm glad you enjoy the videos. Um, and then the sort of the last option for this is seeding other planets. So you know, there's a lot of talk of like terraform, terraforming Mars, which would be ungodly difficult and take like three or four thousand years. Um, you know, uh, and but shipping animals into space is not like a great idea. Um, you know, we have enough trouble with you know horses in trailers, not to mention horses in space. Um, you know, a panicking animal is is not a thing that you want on a spaceship. But if you have artificial womb technology and just you know a, a bunch of frozen cells, when you get where you're going, it, it would be much easier or theoretically, if the technology was developed, it'd be much easier to just clone out a whole bunch of the the animals that you want um, from, like, a genetic stock that you bring along um, as opposed to uh, having to, you know, bring the live animals either in stasis uh, or awake through space. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's just another option. But I think it's, it's one of the, the few actually useful... Uh, uses of the the technology but yeah that's that's kind of it um today we're, we're keeping it a little bit short um insofar as i didn't want to get into the code this time because it feels a little bit cheap to just do one gene uh and you know put it into you know chicken or something uh mainly because it's not really de-extinction like a lot of the the headlines were very clickbaity and i really wanted to sort of talk about um uh, how clickbaity it is and, and the realities of the technology rather than kind of getting into the, the nuts and bolts of, of coding it. And also we got to talk about cloning, which uh, I'm going to just go back up to the cloning uh, section for a second. Scrolly, 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 scroll. Um, you know, recently I was, I was asked by uh, someone, is there any technology that I feel is like out of reach for me personally right now? Because the, the things that we have planned for the rest of the year I mean, is just going to, like, I personally, I think it's going to just blow all of your minds. Um, oh, Seth Love donated. Thank you, Seth. Glad, glad you like the, the videos. Uh, but yeah, so the stuff that we have planned for the rest of the year in, includes, like, growing organoids and, you know, vascularized organoids on a chip and, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I really think that cloning is actually just about the only thing that's out of reach of us at this particular Red Hot second. Um and, but only like barely, like the, the, the biggest, the biggest thing between us and, and cloning is, uh, well, legality, ethics, and money. It's just an extremely expensive process. So, you know, it could be it, like, but there, it's not impossible to say that, you know, five years down the line, when the channel is much bigger and we're, and, you know, we've got more of this stuff under our belt already, um, that we, it isn't something we could do. Um, you know, we, we we could if we got the right licenses and got the right approval and had all the right specifications there's nothing actually stopping us from cloning something uh, be it a mouse or a pig or whatever um i don't 
plan on doing that, but it's it was sort of the the only thing that I thought of. But so when you actually look into like how difficult cloning like is, it's, it's not it's not like that hard. It's mostly the the reagents are really 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 expensive because unsurprisingly, keeping eggs and 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 these sorts of things and embryos growing outside of a womb requires a bunch of very weird specialized chemicals and reagents and proteins that are not cheap because who like what why why do you need a liter of like follicle juice like it's just it's just a weird thing to want to buy um so uh yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty doable it's just very expensive Alrighty, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna end off with some some question time. Um, so I'll, I'll take some questions and and then we'll wrap it up. I'm keeping it a little bit short today. Uh, I'm a little bit under the weather, so uh, I, I don't want to stick around for too too long. Um, but also, I, I think this is kind of fun that we got to talk about cloning and and chromosome printing and chromosome transplantation because it's a lot of stuff that you don't really get to see the nuts and bolts of it uh, very often, um, and especially not in in media or, or literature. All right, um, so question time. All right, let's see what we got. Um, uh, what is the minimum information required for this to work? Simply the DNA? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, if you have a complete uh, genome sequence of something, Theoretically, you can de-extinct it. And even if you're missing chunks, um, if you've got the nearest relative, then you may be able to recreate some, uh, like enough of the code that you end up with something functional. But then that, that gets pretty iffy pretty quickly. Um, okay, uh, here we got a question from Vvoid. Uh, would prion diseases be a worry with lab-grown human brain burgers? Uh, first of all, don't eat brain. Just, just don't. Just don't eat brain. It's not worth it. I don't care how delicious it is. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Like prion disease is the worst way to go. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't. Um, but yeah, prion diseases wouldn't really be a concern um, with uh, lab grown meat that's done properly. Um, this would have to be tested for um, and it would have to be uh, quantified. But if you're not growing brain tissue and eating brain tissue, it's not really an issue. Um, like if you're just growing muscle, like it's not a... Uh, like it's not it's not a particular concern, so yeah, it's uh, you know it's not that bad. Uh, okay, what else we got? Uh, why is the limit 180 on uh, DNA printing? Uh, the limiting factor is the chemistry. Um, currently, DNA is printed using the um, uh, what's it called the phosphoramidite process, where it's it's a series of chemical steps where you are protecting and deprotecting various parts of the molecule to progressively grow the chain. Um, over 180 letters or base pairs, you start getting more and more and more errors. Like the, the process, like the chemistry just gets more and more iffy. So they limit it to that uh, because that's just sort of what they're, what, what the technique is capable of. Um, the future of DNA printing is enzyme-based printing, but it just hasn't gotten to the same point yet. Um, I saw a thing the other day where enzyme-based printing has gotten up to like 60 letters which is just not sufficient. The whole reason people were excited about enzyme-based printing is that theoretically you can get, you know, thousands and thousands of letters printed all at the same time. But it just thus far hasn't materialized that way yet. Um, but, I mean, the technology is always developing, so eventually it will get to that point. And then the price of DNA printing will come way down. Uh, all right, what else we got? Uh, GSG, uh, thanks for the content. Um, you're very welcome. Glad you like it. Um... Uh, what else we got? I'm gonna I'm gonna only I'm gonna do a couple more, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Um, when do you think we're gonna be able to make organisms with desired morphologies? Uh, also, what do you think about artificial base pairs in xenobiology? Um, okay, so crafting an organism to be exactly the way that we want is like a hundred years away, maybe more. Like it's really hard. Um, designing a, an organism de novo uh, to do something is um, very 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 difficult. Like it's it. When it comes to DNA, right, if, if DNA is a language, we're at the point of maybe putting some words together into, like, a basic phrase. We are not at the point of writing books. Um, making an animal is writing a series. Like, it's not even writing one book. It's writing a dozen books. It's very, very difficult 
Um, making small changes to organisms, that's easy. Making big changes, very hard and usually ends in tears. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty far away from that still. Um, okay, what else we got? Uh, how does the cell seal with electricity? Um, when you put the electrical impulse into the cell, it sort of makes all of the lipids and proteins and stuff align. Um, and it, it charges, it changes the charge on the cell itself, which helps make everything kind of stick back together. Um, you know, the cell will naturally just close up the hole if you leave it alone. Um, it, it has mechanisms for doing this. This just helps do it quickly and to make sure that, it, that you end up with the least number of exploded eggs as physically possible. Um, and also, sometimes the electrical pulse isn't actually to seal the egg. Sometimes it's more to... Um, ra yeah, rather than sealing the egg, it, it's actually to kickstart the growth process. So uh, in... Invincible, where they show the Mahler brothers electrocuting the cell and then it starts dividing. That's actually what happens. Sometimes you have to zap it and then it starts dividing as if it has just been fertilized. It's it's really weird. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody understands why that works, but it does, and so people do it. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely possible. Uh, okay. Uh, can you three D print cell scaffolds? Yeah, sure. They do it all the time. Um, there's lots and lots of literature on doing that. Um, it's something I want to do uh, within probably the next year or two um, is 3D printing uh, bone uh, scaffolds and then growing like a set of antlers or printing a skull or something. Uh, okay, I'm going to do one or two more and then we're, we're going to wrap it up for the day. Um, uh, is it possible for plants like uh, cycads where only the female exists to de-extinct the male? Uh, probably not. I mean, unless you have a, a like if you have a sample of a male plant, um, then you can recreate the, the male chromosome. Maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it'd be very tricky if you don't. Um, uh, you'd have to find the nearest neighbor and like fudge it a little bit. Um, but yeah, that would not, would not be easy. Would not be easy at all. Um, what are cell scaffolds made of? Uh, that depends. It could be all kinds of stuff. Um, some people will actually grind up tissue. Like, they'll, they'll decellularize tissue uh, to remove all the cells and leave the extracellular matrix behind, freeze-dry it, grind it up into a powder, mix it with some, like, a gelling agent, um, and then, and, and, like, rehydrate it, and then just print that. Um, or they'll, they'll mix it with, like, a uh, UV polymerizing agent so that way it... Uh, will like they can like res like resin print the the scaffold. Uh, sometimes even with the cells mixed in, which is wild to see. Um, do you know the mechanism used on enzyme based printing? Uh, yeah, so it's using an enzyme called TDT, I think, um, and then they're flowing specially modified um, substrate and enzymes over it like progressively to stick on one letter at a time. It's, it's pretty difficult, but it is possible. Um, but the, the te I'm, but beyond that, I don't know more of the specifics of the technology. I'd have to read in, read up on it. But um, yeah, if you just look up uh, enzyme-based DNA printing, you should find all kinds of results. Um, oh, okay, this is actually, this is a really good one. Um, to what point can you DIY your lab? Uh, my answer is as little as physically possible. Like, there's, there's a, I, especially at the beginning of my career, like I was DIYing a lot of my equipment and it just is not as good. Like there's definitely certain pieces of equipment that you can DIY, but most of it you should just be buying. Like it's, it's one of those things if you're either spending your time making your equipment or you're spending your time using your equipment and you can't do both. So if you actually want to do biology, you should just buy your equipment. If you want to just build bio hardware, you should build a bio hardware. But that's, you know, that's, that's kind of been my, uh, my preference for that. Uh, okay, um, one more, I think. Uh, let's see if I can find a good one. Uh, okay, this, is, this isn't this is going to be it, but I'll just answer this quickly. Is the stream saved as a video? Uh, yes. Um, the uh, These streams stay up, so if you want to go back and, and watch them later, um, they're, they're available on the channel uh, afterwards. Um, all right, I'm just going to scroll around a little bit um, and see if I find a, a really good question to, to wrap things up with. 
Uh, how, oh, actually, this is a fun one. Okay, how realistic or unrealistic is the use of ostrich eggs in Jurassic Park? Actually, it's pretty close. Like, if you were gonna, so if you were gonna try and de-extinct a dinosaur, I mean, first of all, dinosaurs are not extinct. Most, like, a lot of birds are technically classified as dinosaurs, like a chicken is. Um, and there have been some studies, and I want to recreate this. So I have, a, I actually have a piece of T-Rex bone. Um, I didn't bring it uh, here so that I could show it off on camera, but I do have a piece of T-Rex bone. Um, and there has been a bunch of studies where rather than trying to extract DNA out of T-Rex bone, they basically shoot it, they stick it into a machine uh, called a mass spectrometer. And, or like they, they, they crack it open and they take a core sample, they stick it into the mass spec, and then they shoot it with, with a laser beam that boils off a little bit of the surface of the sample. And they actually found that there are protein remnants in the bones. Um, and like they were able to recreate or, or partially sequence the collagen protein that was found in T-Rex bone. So there, there is actually soft tissue uh, preserved after millions of years, which is uh, counter to a lot of what people are you know, taught. Um, but it, yeah, there, there's, there's definitely some debate over that particular bit of research. There's, there's like a lot of talk about contamination and that kind of thing. Um, but there's been a few studies that seem to point to that there is like detectable collagen and other proteins in these bones. So once you have the, the protein sequence, then you can just reverse engineer it, make it into DNA, and then start, you know, one by one putting those genes uh, into a cell, which you could then use like an ostrich egg as a incubator of sorts. In the same way that you could use an elephant egg to grow a mammoth, you might, might be able to at least partially grow something a little more dinosaur-like in an ostrich egg. Um, it would just be, again, it would just be very difficult. Like, I think it would probably take you 50 to 100 years to get this to work properly. Um, but it's, the, the big, really the biggest limitation is the lack of, of like the protein and DNA samples from dinosaurs. Like the, the samples are highly degraded. Even, even the little bits of, bits of protein that they were able to, to tease out are highly, highly degraded. And when they were able to finally put it together into a, into a full protein sequence, it was essentially identical to chicken collagen. So like, D, like T-Rex collagen and chicken collagen, as far as anybody can tell, is essentially the same protein and it's been completely unchanged over millions of years. So that's it's very cool and it's very weird, but at the same time, it's it's not enough to build an entire T-Rex. You're still missing most of its genome, uh, the, the overwhelming majority. So you could start to tease out details, but you're never going to get a Jurassic Park. You could get like an Ice Age Park. Like Ice Age Park could totally be a thing. Uh, the nice thing is a lot of those animals died in ice. So you can just go dig them up out of the per uh, out of the permafrost if you get lucky, um, and then you have all the DNA that you could ever want. Um, but dinosaurs are just so damn old that it's it's just essentially impossible. However, I mean the main concept in uh, Jurassic Park of you know finding mosquitoes and getting the blood out of the mosquitoes is less ridiculous than you'd think. I don't think the DNA would be preserved properly, but if there was ever a chance to preserve proteins, that might actually be it. Um, you, but you're, you, I mean, the, the sequences are going to be so heavily degraded that actually like resurrecting an entire dinosaur is just not going to happen. Um, all right. I, I think I'm going to do one more. Like, I, I keep saying, I'm going to do one, just one more, just one more. Um, uh, are there any other good questions? Otherwise we're going to, we're going to call it for a day. Um, Yeah, they, they, yeah, somebody said they, they used all kinds of different eggs in Jurassic Park, depending on the size of the thing. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. If you're making a small dinosaur, use a chicken. If you're making a big dinosaur, use something bigger. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so, what else we got? Uh, do we have ice preserved saber tooth? I have no idea. Not a clue. Um, but if you have, even if it's not ice preserved, even if you've just got the bones, it is possible to extricate uh, DNA samples. Like this is how we've been able to build the DNA samples of Neanderthals and Denisovians and other ancient uh, hominids um, and other ancient species. Like as long as it's less than like, you know, 50 to 100,000 years, you can tease out some of the DNA. 
Um, the, the trouble with Neanderthals or Neanderthals is that our DNA and their DNA is so close that it's very difficult to tell which is which, um, because there was a lot of like interbreeding. Like we were technically different species, but not by like the way we define species. Cause you shouldn't have been able to breed if we were truly different. And yet, um, a lot of our DNA is their DNA. So it wasn't really that they went extinct so much as the species kind of fused violently. Um, <laughs> So it's it's a bit of a bit of a mess. But um, if you have saber tooth cat uh, fossils, or not fossils, but like specimens, um, the uh, the the dental pulp is actually one of the best places to get DNA from. And they actually so in Egyptian mummies, one of the best best places to get sequenceable DNA out of an Egyptian mummy is the dental pulp. So you basically you pull a tooth, and then right in the core of it, there's some soft tissue, or there was some soft tissue that is basically protected from all of the stuff that happens during either mummification and also the thousands of years that the corpse is left to sit in a tomb somewhere. Um, and But the dental pulp leaves it really quite well preserved. So the way that we've been able to figure out, um, you know, there's there were a couple of mummies that were found that were suspected to be um, re- like Nefertiti or, or one other famous mummies. Um, this is sort of how they're starting to tease this out, which is these these dental pulp extractions. Um, and if you have a saber tooth cat and it's in good enough condition, theoretically you might be able to get enough of the DNA out of it uh, that you could de-extinct it if you were so inclined. But it would be again, I mean, all these all the de-extinction stuff is just hard. Like none of it's impossible. It's just really, really, really hard and really, really, really expensive, um, and and a little bit pointless. Other than it's awesome, like. Like at the end of the day, the only like the, it's like why would you de-extinct a mammoth? I don't know. It's cool. <laughs> you can ride a mammoth around. Um, but I mean, it's it's you know why do we do anything? Why do we build fast cars? Why do we build rockets to go to other planets? Mostly because it's cool. Like you know, like the Discovery Channel or, or NASA or whatever will like bill it as oh you know a search for discovery and the greater humanity. If you ask any of the engineers, why did you build the giant rocket? They're not going to go, oh, because I want to do such a... They're like, I wanted to make the giant thing go kaboom. <laughs> like, most most scientists don't, like, are... Like, we like to performatively say that the reason that we do science is, like, the betterment of humanity and stuff. 99% of the time, it's because it sounded fun or it sounded cool. It's like, why why did you de-extinct a mammoth? I don't know. sounded fun. <laughs> like, it's... At the end of the day, um, like... All of these sorts of things you do because it's cool. Like some pe- like unless you're actually working on something that will dramatically help the population, like you know making wheat the size of corn, um, like you're just not going to. You're like all, most of the things you're doing in science are because it sounded fucking awesome, and you know you're going to be spending the next five to twelve to fifteen years of your life on it. So you might as well enjoy it. Um, like for me, like, why do I grow neurons? Like, why do I want to grow neurons and have it play doom? Because it sounds cool. <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's actually going to, like, if we manage to get neurons to play doom, it will legitimately be a breakthrough. It will be the most complicated thing that anybody's ever gotten neurons to do. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because it sounds fun. <laughs> um, and it's like, it's, it's why not? So that's, that's kind of where you go with that. Um, Okay, let's see if we can do one more, and then I really gotta, I, I really gotta wrap it up. Um, okay, what sequencing services do you recommend or use? Uh, the only service that I use at the moment is pla- uh, is Plasmidosaurus, uh, but that's only for sequencing plasmids. Um, I haven't, I don't do a lot of full genome stuff, so it's just not something I've had to worry about. Uh, okay. Um, I think that might be it. I think that might be it. I think we're I think we're out of questions for the day. So uh, yeah, um, I think we'll I think we'll end it there. Um, the uh, we've got a lot of we got a lot of fun stuff coming up on the channel. So if you haven't already, be sure to like the video, subscribe, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, the next couple of months I think are going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're we're trying to get a video out for the end of this month, but it might be out sort of beginning to middle of May. Um, we'll see. Uh, but that we'll be growing some uh, like mammalian cells and genetically modifying them. We have the neuron video coming out very soon, where we're going to be like growing our first batch of neurons on these beautiful brand new electrode arrays. Um, this is another little uh, thing that I brought in. It's it's again, it's really hard to see. 
Um, yeah, doesn't show up well on camera. But uh, this is a, a laser cut test. Um, so part of making these new neuron arrays involves using a, a, a fiber laser to cut very, very tiny holes. Um, so all of that's coming in a new video very soon. I'm very excited for it. Um, we've got a whole, we, like a lot of neuron stuff this year. We've got a lot of mammalian stuff this year. We've got lasers. We've got high temperature stuff. Just a lot, a lot of stuff. So uh, yeah, if you're if you're interested in all of that, highly recommend subscribing. But other than that, I'm gonna leave it there. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. There'll be another stream. Um, either end of this month or around the same time next month. We're sort of figuring that out. We still want to do the uh, million subscriber celebration stream because we've we've no, we've blown right past a million subscribers way faster than I thought we were going to and before we got a chance to do the celebration stream. So we'll come back to that uh, very soon. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, I hope you guys have enjoyed. It's been a lot of fun and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day. Bye.